but, done. But isn't, there, isn't it true, Dr. Wolf, that if the rich get richer, everybody else gets marginally richer as well, even if the wealth gap widens? Is that true based on your observation? No, no, that's not true. Let me give you a simple example. Oh, that is true. That's From, the facts. No, no here's the, the facts. Here's the facts. From 1970s, middle 1970s, to pretty much now, the real wage in the United States has gone nowhere. It's a stagnant line. goes like this. If you average it out, it's between a quarter and half a percent per year, which is a statistical nothing. Meanwhile, the productivity, I mean, that's wrong. the productivity of the worker has gone straight up in a line of one to two percent across that time. That, that's not true. But productivity is what the worker gives the employer. Wage but, is but what your, the your employer... facts are incorrect, Richard. Your facts are incorrect. Please, you know, under Kennedy, where we had the big tax cuts, there wages, median wages went way up for workers during that period. Now, when we had Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, they didn't. You're very right there, but you can't clop all these things together as one thing. The productivity growth under Reagan was much higher than it was under Carter or under uh, Lyndon Johnson or under these others. You got to look at what actually happened, sir. You can't just collapse them all into big things and say no way Productiv productivity growth under Kennedy and under Reagan was much much higher than the other right, ones I, and it I'm was much higher under Donald Trump as well you've right. got to look at what happens not what you like to happen and what you I agree talk I about, agree you, you've got but to I'm, not blow I'm, me you got to go hit me with the numbers let's get the yearly I data just, on I, productivity and I'll just show right. you the facts and hope you concede the position that you're wrong I'm very honored today to be hosting a debate between two great economists on the merits of capitalism versus socialism. How do we create a more prosperous economy? Is there an ideal or optimal economic system to achieving that goal? How does a nation solve the problem of income inequality? And should we tax the rich and redistribute wealth to the poor? These are issues and topics we'll be discussing with Arthur Laffer and Richard Wolff. Arthur Laffer, currently chairman of Laffer Associates, is an economist who served on Ronald Reagan's Economic Policy Advisory Board. Widely considered the father of supply-side economics, he is well known for the Laffer Curve, a theory that states there is an optimal tax rate that could optimize tax revenues for the government. Richard Wolff is the co-founder of Democracy at Work and the professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is a renowned economist who is currently a visiting professor of the New School University of New York and has previously taught at Yale City College of the City of New York and the University of Paris Sorbonne. His work features an approach to political economy associated with the Marxist school of thought. Gentlemen, I've had the privilege of speaking with both of you individually, and it's an absolute honor and treat to have both of you together to discuss some very important issues. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Dave. Thank you as well. Let's start with the first question that uh, perhaps we can both uh, make opening statements for, which is how to solve the problem of the underperformance of the U.S. economy, assuming that there is an underperformance, and I'll let you both address this assumption and perhaps the solutions to this problem. Uh, Professor Wolf, I'll let you start first. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what one would mean by underperformance. There were clearly periods of time when the United States economic uh, engine was purring along very, very well. Uh, I would argue that particularly after our civil war, uh, the economy took off in a remarkable way. Before the civil war, it was an economy heavily dependent on a very few items for its economic growth, mostly cotton from the slave south and so on, uh, some development of manufacturing in the north. But it was really after the clash between the capitalist system of the North and the slave system of the South, uh, defeating the slavery, destroying that economy, basically by depriving the slave owners of their property, to wit, slaves. You then had a uniform capitalism uh, taking over in the South, as well as expanding in the North, and the American U.S. capitalist system took off. And it at first had to struggle among other countries within the larger global framework of the British Empire. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, it had established itself as the successor 
empire. The only possible alternatives or competitors were Germany and Japan. Uh, World War I took care of Germany. World War II took care of Japan. And you were left with the period after World War II when the United States basically was king of the hill and took off in a remarkable way. Through most of that period, uh, at least the last century, but probably a bit more, you could say that U.S. capitalism was not underperforming. It was performing extraordinarily well. It delivered to the American working class uh, a century of rising real wages, at least until the 1970s when that stopped. But for most of the period before that, you had um, a, a capitalism that was exemplary. It gave to the American people the idea they lived in a charmed universe. If they were religious, they thanked God for all of that. If they weren't religious, they thanked the capitalist economic system for carrying them not only big profits, but rising real wages. Okay, in the 1970s, that happy story came to an end. And it's very important to understand that if you want to look at a period of underperformance, well, then the 1970s into the 80s is the inflection point. It's when U.S. capitalism stopped being the engine of spectacular economic growth and became instead a laggard, a society that wasn't growing anywhere near as fast relative to others as had been the case. So what, what is going on in these last 40 to 50 years is a radical or reorganization of the world economy. The United States was the successor to the British Empire. After World War II, it was the American Empire, no longer the British Empire. And Britain is a fantastic show for what happens when you lose your empire. Britain is now well along in returning to its original status of being a cold, wet, offshore island to the continent of Europe. And if the United States is not careful, it is going to reproduce that sad story. It is well underway already. What happened? Well, what happened very briefly is that the United States exported, because it was profitable to industry, much of its manufacturing sector. The last 50 years, the percentage of American workers in manufacturing has gone from 30 percent plus to 10 percent plus. I mean, a spectacular hollowing out of the manufacturing base of this economy. It likewise found much more profitable investment opportunities outside the United States than inside. And it took ample advantage of that making the United States less of an attractive place in which to do business. The wages in the rest of the world were lower. The government regulations in many cases were fewer or could be purchased to be reduced. Uh, I won't say bribery because that's a bad word, but we all know, I hope, what I'm talking about. And then we had societies around the world, because the world is not governed by the United States, wasn't even back in the 70s. We have countries around the world eager to bring in the investment, eager to become the next phase of economic development, eager to enter into the growth period that the United States has to now look at as part of its past history. And most important among them is the People's Republic of China. Over the last 30 years, its GDP has grown two to three times more per year than that of the United States. That is an incredible record. This country, one of the poorest on earth in the middle of the 20th century, is contesting with the United States, as I speak, for the dominant position in the world. That's an unbelievable record of economic growth. I'm not arguing pro or con China. 
I'm talking about the factuality of what economic growth has achieved in a society that was the largest by population that isn't particularly well-versed in resources. Final point. Final point. I don't want to monopolize the time and take it away from my colleague, Art Laffer. China calls itself socialism with Chinese characteristics. It is one kind of socialism because it mixes together private enterprise, both Chinese and foreign, and government-owned and operated enterprise. That's one kind of uh, socialism, powerful coordination from the top by a communist party. Scandinavia, West Germany, France, that's another kind of socialism. It's a private capitalism with heavy government intervention. Soviet Union, not with us anymore, was the government taking over most. Socialism used to be thought of as the government stepping in. But that's old socialism, and that's not where socialism is going now. Now the focus of socialism, partly out of a self-critique, is to change the organization of the producing unit, the enterprise, from a top-down hierarchical system to one based on democracy at the workplace or what you might want to call worker co-ops. That, the argument of socialists now goes, is a better foundation to overcome the problems of capitalism than any other available alternative. Let me stop there. Okay. Uh, lots to unpack later. Dr. Laffer, I'll let you respond to the same uh, question. So how to solve the problem of the underperformance of the U.S. economy, if you indeed think that the U.S. economy is underperforming per your definition? Uh, I do believe it is underperforming. And I think to really understand the, uh, the way to solve or to describe that underperformance is to see why it occurred. Uh, and I agree with uh, uh, with Professor Wolf very much on a lot of the development there. And uh, in fact, the whole concept of uh, economic surplus is one of Marxist uh, derivation. He and I both shared a professor long ago and far away in Professor Paul Baran, who specialty was economic growth and the vent for surplus uh, in the quid pro quo system. And, you know, what you found is that the capitalism did, in fact, uh, provide the prosperity that he said it did. It did so by using price systems, the quid pro quo system there. It created economic growth, an enormously prosperous world. Uh, that prosperous world, I think, stopped really in 1930. Uh, I would say the Great Depression was the first real clear chink in the whole system of economics. And it wasn't because of capitalism failing. Uh, the 1930s was a failure of government, not of capitalism. Uh, this is when government went way beyond the role it should play in, in an economy. Uh, you know, there is a major role in a capitalist system for government. Uh, you need to have taxes. What you need is a low rate, broad based flat tax. Uh, you need spending restraint. Uh, you need sound money. Uh, you need minimum regulations and you need free trade. And all those are areas where government should protect the economy and allow those exchanges to occur without monopoly developing, without the private sector uh, destroying its own prosperity. And, and if you look at it, I mean, let's just say in the beginning, uh, prior to 1913, when the income tax was put into the United States, uh, I think total government spending as a share of GDP was less than 3%. Uh, government was funded almost entirely by uh, a broad-based flat tariff, not a protective tariff, but a revenue tariff. We had the sale of lands. We had some taxes on sins. I think the alcohol tax was, that was primarily the way government funded itself. And it did its role very well. And the U.S. exceeded all expectations. It became uh, the number one in the world. The Great Depression, we raised the highest marginal income tax rate from 24% uh, to 94% in 1944. Uh, you know, we destroyed the system with huge increases in government spending. And, of course, a military venture that was just outrageous beyond belief. And that was really where government became too large. And right now, uh, government is way, way, way too large and is inhibiting the capitalist system from really expanding wealth, prosperity, and uh, jobs for all. And this is why I think we've had the failure is because of too much government and because of bad policies on taxes, spending, monetary policy, regulatory policy, and trade policy. Those are the five kingdoms 
of macroeconomics. And if the government were to retract back to where it should be, uh, as we tried to do under the Reagan administration, uh, I think we could recreate that long-term prosperity with a capitalist system with, without having to have a, a, a Marxist or a socialist takeover. I think uh, Professor Wolf and I do agree very much on the failure of redistribution of the Keynesian, what, what he called the European socialist model. That system has failed terribly, and we need to get away from that system totally. And I think we both agree that that system is awful, and just it's the difference in where we go in the future that really discriminates between what his view and what my view are. I think we need to have low rate broad based flat taxes and private sector. And he would like to see much more government control of the means of production. And with that, I think we both have the same view of the underperformance and uh, different views of how to solve it. Uh, Dr. Wolf, I'll let you respond to that. Do you agree that the government is too large per uh, Dr. Laver's analysis? Well, let me try to underscore the difference here. Um, I, I'm i going to exaggerate, but I want to make the point. I don't find it terribly exciting anymore to debate whether the government's role is too large or too little. Partly that's because I don't see the government as an independent actor in this drama. I see our government here in the United States, as I see most governments, heavily shaped, influenced, controlled by, in a capitalist system, the captains of industry, the corporate titans, whatever you want to call them. I don't see the government as an independent actor. When Dr. Laffer says, correctly in my view, that in the 1930s, the government came in in a massive way, I say absolutely. And the reason is that private capitalism collapsed and was facing the very socialist revolution that is their worst nightmare. Because, you know, remember the 1930s isn't that many years later than 1917 when that revolution happened in Russia that frightened them all. And they were terrified and they brought the government in to bail them out which is what it did. Just like in 2008 and 9, when we had the so-called Great Recession, they brought in the government to bail them out. The government has been bailing out capitalism for quite some time because capitalism, if I had the time I would take uh, to do this, is a very unstable system. When I teach my classes, I lean across the podium and I say to my students, if you lived with a roommate as unstable as capitalism, you would have moved out long ago. But you live with a capitalism from which, at least so far, you can't see an escape. So I'm not interested in the debate between private and the government. Strikes me when I look at factories in uh, Russia, and I looked at factories here in the United States, for the average worker, it doesn't make all that much difference whether the board of directors is elected by the shareholders or whether it's put in place by the government apparatus or by a political party. The basic relationship of the worker to the work process isn't all that different. Therefore, for me, the way forward is to look at the problem that we have not faced, which is the way we organize the workplace. We give a tiny group of people, board of directors, major shareholders, owner operator, an extraordinary power. These are not elected people. These are not democratically responsible people. They decide what the price of the product will be, what the technology is, what they will produce, and they decide what to do with the surplus produced by the army of employees who have to live with the result. My basic argument, and I believe the argument of socialism in the 21st century, will be that organization is the problem. And we have to be able and willing as a society to question that organization rather than to assume it's the best, the latest, the best human beings can do, and then argue about whether the government should do more or less. 
I'm not interested. I think that's a lower priority than this fundamental question, which we in capitalism have evaded for most of the history of the capitalist system. And last point, that's what the slaves and the uh, slavery did, and that's what feudalism did. They argued over lots of questions, but they didn't question until it was too late the very relationship in production of master-slave, of lord and serf, well, we ought to be questioning employer, employee, has that system run out, stop being an engine of growth and become the obstacle we have as a new generation to overcome? Dr. Laffer, I'll let you respond to that before we move on to the next point. Sure. Let me let me if I can respond. I think the Great Depression started with the smooth hauling tariff which passed the Senate and the House in 1929, was signed into law in 1930. If you look at my book, Taxes Have Consequences, you'll see that it was clearly that. The 20s had provided enormous prosperity, full employment, great prosperity. Capitalism worked wonderfully well then. And then it was the government imposition of that tariff that started. The response was Herbert Hoover raising the highest marginal income tax rate from 24%, as I said, to 94%, and just perpetuated that. That, to me, was government that caused that problem and capitalism could have solved it but in fact government just took over and ruined it let me go to the example of china that he put in i was the first american to go to china in modern times i went in uh, october of 1970 with george schultz and john ehrlichman uh, i was in the nixon white house at the time just before kissinger's trip at that time in 1970 china uh, 93 percent of all chinese production went through state-run enterprises uh, they were a hermit kingdom. They had an un horrible currency, everything. From 1970, they took state-run uh, state operations from 93% down to less than 10%. That's called a tax cut. And they really reduced the amount of industry that went through state-run enterprises from 93 to about a little less than 10%. They hooked the, U uh, the yuan uh, to the U.S. dollar in 1992, they they really you know, they outsourced monetary policy to Alan Greenspan. Inflation stopped, bang. They expanded trade enormously. Uh, they went from the hermit kingdom to a wide open export market. Uh, that's free trade. The three pillars here are tax cuts, sound money, and free trade. And China grew, and I mean China grew. China grew in real output per per adult uh, by about 66 fold. During this period, the U.S. grew by about three and a half fold, fourfold. So you can see how the Chinese system really, really worked. And I believe it's because of capitalism, because of free markets that caused the Chinese enormous growth. I'm a huge fan of China, a big advocate. But then with Xi coming in in the last five or six years, the state run has now come back into power. Chinese growth, I think, is over. Uh, I think China's on a death spiral coming down because of government intervention in destroying the free markets there. So to me, uh, the organization, we have the plan. We know how to solve problems of economic growth, and that's by getting a government's paws out of it, having a low rate, broad-based flat tax, sound money. The gold standard worked for two and a half centuries with no inflation, aggregate inflation. So you can see what happened since Smithsonian, and I was right there with Smithsonian when they unhinged the dollar. You can see the inflation that occurred. Government spending, as I told you, went from 3% in 1912, 1910 of total GDP. It's now, you know, what, 30%, something like that, more than that. Uh, if you look at regulations, regulations are hugely burdensome, way beyond the specific purpose at hand. Uh, they've destroyed the ability of private sector to do a good job and free trade. We've got all these people around. And this is what Smoot Hawley did was all of these people around what trying to sanction foreigners, trying to do intercede in foreign affairs. Trade is not a political tool. We make some things better than foreigners and foreigners make some things better than we do. We and they would be foolish in the extreme if we didn't sell them those products they make better than we do, uh, that we make better than they do in exchange for those products they make better than we do it's a win 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 that's where free trade comes in and you know to me the the problems today of underperformance are exclusively because of government growing way beyond it should growth and i think that's the prime issue not some second order issue i think that's the prime issue and all the problems with capitalism that do exist and that the pre professor wolf correctly enunciates our secondary issues. The real thing is how do you in aggregate solve a problem? There are gonna be lots and lots of minor issues in there, but capitalism is the solution, not the problem. 
uh, Professor Wolf would like to respond to that. I mean, uh, you've been certainly asked this before in the sense that many countries in the past that have adopted pure socialist systems have failed in some sort of sense. Can you address the failures of socialism and whether or not countries that have failed in, were, did indeed fail because of socialism or because of other factors? Yeah, I find it bizarre, this endless repetition of the notion that socialism has failed. I have no idea what you're talking about. If by socialism you mean, for example, government intervention on a fairly massive level, then there are many countries, including the United States, who had the government intervene. For example, follow Dr. Laffer. After the 1930s, the government was a bigger player than it was before. But the period after World War II is a period of remarkable growth. You had very high tax rates and you had remarkable economic growth. Now, the way you can handle that is suggest that the growth had another cause and the tax, uh, the government intervention was not only not the cause of it, but the limit. But that's a bizarre argument. There are many factors that cause everything and you're simply noticing an association and the association of socialism as massive government intervention is not an association with low economic growth. It's often an association with rapid economic growth. The Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party have been very powerful institutions for the entire history since the revolution in 1949. They call what they do socialism. They don't shy away from that. They extol it. I find it then bizarre when the West, here the United States, confronts the spectacular growth performance of China and then makes the convenient logical leap, well, that must be because of its capitalism. Wait a minute, that's called tautology. If you infer capitalism from economic growth, then you can nicely tell the story, having inferred A from B, that B is the cause of A. But you can't do that. You know, you, you learn in psych in philosophy course, you can't kind of do that. The Chinese give the government massive control. I don't find that all that exciting because for me, I'm struck by the fact that whether you're in the United States and you have extraordinary inequality of wealth and income, and you go to China and you find they're the number two country producing billionaires these days uh, after the United States and rapidly catching up, you've got inequalities that I find morally and well as economically indefensible. The critique of capitalism has always been on one foundation above all others. It produces a spectacular inequality of wealth and income. And I see that linked to the government being the tool of those with the wealth and being the problem for those without it. If you Can don't I respond to a little... Let me let, just let me, by King, can I respond as you go? I'm, I'm getting a lot of issues. I, I think where we should interact here, uh, Professor, is, is that uh, what I tried to say, and, and maybe I didn't make it clear, is that my view of what caused the Great Depression, we were hugely profitable, that the initiation, uh, the initial action that caused the system was the smooth holly tariff, uh, xenophobia, if you will, in the U.S., and that was it. It's not just an association. Uh, you have association, then you have insertion, and once you, you have to have association for causation, uh, then you have to have isolation, which I think my book goes through very carefully, and taxes have consequences, and then you have to have insertion, which is the which is the uh, tariff of 1929, 30, that really brought the beginning of the collapse of a very prosperous. In China, I tried to go through again. It was a state-run enterprise. No question, it's communist government politically. It was there. But what they did on the on the uh, on the springtime in China was they really cut taxes dramatically. They put in a sound money policy and a free trade policy, and that's where you got that enormous growth. It wasn't because they had a communist government. They've had a communist government throughout the whole period, but their performance was very different during when they didn't have the free free markets and when they did. And now you see it being withdrawn, and you see the communist economic economy of China collapsing before our very eyes. That's what I'm trying to say is it's cause and effect. China had huge tax cuts. 
It had sound money and it had free trade, which created that 66 fold increase in real GDP per adult. And then once they've withdrawn that, you can see right now the collapse before you. Same thing with Chile. Now, I was down there in Chile in 1973, 74 with the Chicago boys. Uh, what we did and the changes in 1977, 78 with the economy, you got the most prosperous economy in South America, phenomenal performance relative to all the other economies there because of the policies put in, not because of association of A with B or B with A, but because of the policies. And now you find it reversing itself once they've gone back to a socialist system there of government trying to control all the economy. And you can see the collapse of Chile before our very eyes. So I see it very much as a cause and effect, not as just an association. Uh, it's really not. I really do believe it. In the book, uh, after World War II, we had massive tax cuts and a huge reduction in government spending as a share of GDP. Government spending as a share of GDP during World War II was almost 50 percent of GDP. And it was all blown up in Europe and Asia. I mean, it exploded. Once you got that stopped, all of a sudden you got the income effects of a very prosperous, exploding economic growth because of the withdrawal of government spending, not in spite of it. And there were major Major tax cuts, overridden Truman's vetoes of them, major tax cuts that also came at that time. And then you got the four stooges, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, the largest assemblage of bipartisan ignorance probably ever put on planet Earth. And, okay. and, and you saw what happened to the U.S. economy. You know, you saw what happened when Reagan came in, you know, from January 1st, 1983, to June 30th, 1984. That's an 18 month period, real GDP grew by 12% in real terms during that period. That's at an 8% per annum compound rate. That is the old timey Chinese growth rate. So I think if you look at the correlations and the causations, I think we could have a very interesting discussion, but I tried to go through all of this in my book, Taxes Have Consequences, chapter by chapter, looking at these things. I, I'm wrong a lot, Professor, so don't Please forgive me. I, I I make errors all the damn time. You can you can ask my ex-wife about some of the uh, personal ones as well. But that's what I'd love to discuss. I think that's where Professor Wolf I think has a, 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 a had a final point. Yeah, I had another point. Let let let, let me answer just two, go, three go, little, go. just as precisely as I can. Looking at the world today, since you refer re repeatedly to the so-called collapse of of uh, China. I'm now going to use the projections of the International Monetary Fund, clearly not a Chinese institution, clearly not friendly to China, et cetera. They have a prediction that's out right now for what economic growth will be through the rest of 2023 and through 2024. The prediction for the United States is 2%. The prediction for China is five and a half percent. That's the same two to three to one ratio we've seen for the last 30 or 40 years. The argument that the Chinese economy is not the leading growth sector of the world today, that just doesn't hold. Even if you read the financial press, the whole financial press is counting on China pulling the world economy out of the recession that is already there in England, that will arrive in the next couple of months in Germany, and that is expected to hit this country at the end of this year or next. Let, let me just... Uh, well, yeah, well, I love the... Let me just finish the Professor Wolf just finished. Let me just finish yeah. the point. I want to give you, let me grant to you, I mean, I wouldn't if we had more time, but I'm going to grant to you Smoot-Hawley tariff before the October crash of the economy in 1929 is an important factor. Thank and you. anything else that the government does is an important factor. I don't dispute that the government has an impact. I dispute that it makes much of a difference in terms of what we're talking about. If you want to explain the Great Depression based on Smart Hooley, uh, Smoot Hawley, sorry, then you have to explain why the Smoot Hawley tariff comes into being, because it comes out of the prosperous 1920s, largely private capitalist system, which is continually causing problems because, for example, one group of industries needing a tariff persuades or buys the government to do it. 
That happens all the time. There's nothing in private capitalism that prevents that from happening, just like private capitalism generates monopoly capitalism, which is then undone for some more competition. For me, you haven't answered the question when you say the government made something happen, because I will explain to you how capitalism makes the government do or not do what it does most of the time. Our tax system is a function of rich people getting out of paying the taxes. At the end of World War II, the top uh, rank private level of income tax was, as you correctly said, 94%. Today, it's in the high 30s. That's a spectacular tax cut, right? That wasn't done for economic growth. That was done because rich people don't want to pay taxes, and they have the money to make sure that the tax rates are lower. Marx's argument always was that capitalism will undo itself. And the answer is, yeah, it does that. And part of the way it does that is unequal income and wealth. Part of the way is it's unstable every four year crash. And part of it is using the power of the private wealth to shape the government in ways that end up not only bailing them out when they fail, but bringing the system down in some of the ways Art Laffer points out. For me, this is a spectator sport as capitalism undoes itself the way the previous systems okay. also uh, did. I've got, I've got I'll let Dr. Laffer respond. Yeah, I mean, you're totally right, by the way. The smooth holly tariff was brought in by the electric... It was brought in by a bunch of politicians who thought they could protect industries in the United States by putting on tariffs on foreigners. Totally, totally correct. And then their response to the collapse was to insert more government, et cetera. But we have learned lessons on that. And if you if you look at the period here and what the professor is also saying, which is, again, completely correct, when you have high tax rates, the rich, uh, the rich are different from the rest of the people in the world. They're rich. And they can afford lawyers, accountants, deferred income specialists, favor grabbers, lobbyists. When you see a group of people hanging with Obama, Obama, uh, it's not a group of street people trying to explain to him what it's like being poor. It's a group of people from Goldman Sachs trying to sell their new tax shelter, et cetera. That is all true. Uh, but when you look at socialist systems, the fall failures of capitalism are very clear. They're very apparent. And Professor Wolf is right that they're right there in front of but they're also equally well there with the socialist system. In fact, they're more so. When you look at systems under socialism, they don't have any type of self-correcting mechanism to bring them back off the disastrous death spiral that we do. We were able to get through the Great Depression because we were able to shift back into a capitalist system after World War II. The socialist governments don't do that. They don't have a method back. There's no way that the power of Chairman G can be undone and those controls ever reversed in the Chinese prospect or in Russia or in Chile uh, or these other countries. You know, so I, I would argue that the the production thing in in a in a communist system is just not there. I'd love to have the professor explain what he believes the policy should be of a socialist government that does have total control and what they would do. Uh, to create the proxy. What is their version of the quid pro quo to create uh, the event for surplus, which was the starting question? Professor Wolf, I'll let you respond to that and also comment on the inequality that you've brought up several times uh, up until now. Uh, the problem of inequality, I'll just read you a few statistics. So from the Federal Reserve uh, data, currently the bottom 50% of the United States, they hold roughly $3.4 trillion of household wealth. Now, the top 50% holds the remaining $140 trillion. So the top 10% holds $53 trillion, while the top 1% alone holds eight times the entire bottom 50%. According to statistics uh, released in 2022, nearly 56% of Americans don't have $1,000 in their savings account to cover emergency expenses. Is this going to lead to social unrest is my First question. And second, what can we do to address maybe this income inequality problem that a lot of people think is a problem? Okay, let me try quickly uh, uh, to answer. On the question, will it cause social unrest? I, I think we already see. It's not will it. It already is. 
Look at our political system. Look at the phenomena of Trump or any of the other signs of it, whether it's, you know, the, the impending collapse in the next few days of the uh, subsidy for child care, which is going to take, you know, three or four million women out of the labor force, if not more, uh, suddenly because they're not going to have child care, which they need in order to work. I mean, we are seeing social unrest in our cities, in our society, uh, 12 different ways. You'd have to be blind. We lose 100,000 people to opioid overdoses every year. These are staggering signs. Only people with a need not to see what's going on would miss the fact that we are in deep trouble and that at least part of the story has to do with the extraordinary inequality uh, that exists in our society in terms of what people can access in the way of emotional support, physical support, food, clothing, shelter, education, and all the rest. So we're already there. Capitalism is in deep trouble. But what's your answer? What would you do? Good. That's the second part. My answer okay. is where I think socialism is going. My answer is the problem starts a crucial part of it, which we have not addressed in the organization, as I said, of the enterprise. Let me simply sketch for you. what would Just do an imaginary effort with me, because the socialism I'm talking about doesn't exist, not in Scandinavia, not in the Soviet Union, and not in the People's Republic. It's a new way of thinking about socialism. It's not against the government versus private. It's a new direction. Here it is. You organize the workplace the way you organize the community, democratically. What do I mean? It's one person, one vote. We get together in the enterprise, the factory, the office, the store, and we decide collectively what we're going to do, what we're going to produce, what technology we're going to use, where we're going to carry out the production, and what we're going to do with the surplus, or if you like, the profits our enterprise generates. Here's what that will mean. Will we democratically give a few people at the top trillions of dollars while the rest of us don't have a thousand dollars to take care of an emergency? Answer, we're not going to do that. Are we going to do something that is profitable, but destroys the environment, destroys the climate of the planet we depend on? No, because yeah, we are interested in profit, but we're also interested in all the things not measured by, not symbolized by, Profit. We're going to have a range of objectives. Profit is one, but only one. We're going to take care of the environment because we depend on it. And we're going to distribute wealth much more equally because that's what we want as a society. And that's what we democratically produce. We're not going to have, and here's my concluding point, we're not going to have inside the workplace the very kings and queens we no longer permit in the political space. The monarchs we got rid of four centuries ago have cleverly come back. They're inside the enterprise where they're called the CEO, the CIO, the CFO. They're the people who aggregate to themselves the, tr the enormous bulk of the surplus we all help to produce. And if we democratically change that, if we make the worker co-op the basis of our enterprise system rather than the top-down hierarchical capitalist enterprise, I think we have a chance to deal with the kinds of social crises and inequalities we've been talking about. Dr. Laffer, what's your by the way. proposition? I'll let you respond. Yeah, yeah just, just I don't think that will happen when you have the local democracies uh, they will immediately turn into leadership, different groups like like unions are. Uh, union leadership is just as monopolistic, capitalistic as any business is today. And democracy at the local level will not be able to solve this sort of general climate, all that other stuff. It's just not going to happen. It will devolve immediately into a different type of hierarchical system that will lead to even worse results than having a marketplace determine it. That, that's my view of the world. And I think that a lot of what uh, Professor Wolf is talking about is uh, is intrinsic in the human condition. 
uh, is that countries almost always have leaders, have almost always have a hierarchical top-down system, and that uh, basically <laughs> democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for dinner. Uh, and I, I, I think that that happens at the local level, at the top level. I don't see much different uh, here in the city of Nashville and the governance of Nashville itself versus the governance of the U.S. All of those democratic systems collapse the lower and lower they get, and it becomes exploitation. Uh, I think the only hope we can have is to have a, a, a government that tries to level the playing field, to, tries to have laws, antitrust laws, tries to have monetary policy, trade policy, incomes policies, and also uh, tax policies and spending policies that level the field, that allow individual incentives to really produce the amount of surplus that we really need in this country to provide for prosperity for a lot of people. But income inequality is a state of nature that I don't think we can eliminate by trying to redistribute and cause everyone to lose. Dr. Laffer, is it is it true though that, I'll just follow up and I'll let Dr. Wolf sure. respond. Is it true that uh, a surplus is what we need in our economy? Aren't surpluses mismanaged is one argument. Aren't surpluses just hoarded by the wealthy and not distributed properly so that everybody is prosperous? No, I don't believe that at all. I think Salk, Jonas Salk, the vaccine was used by everybody. It solved poly, a polio problem. I think uh, Twitter is a one by Elon Musk or whoever it was. It's used by almost everyone. They all tweet or X to each other. Uh, I look at all of these things that cars, the monop cars now are everywhere. If you look at U.S. cars today, they're much better than they were. I mean, all of these capitalists that develop these industries, the benefits have flown right down. We have refrigerators, we have air conditioning, we have heating, we have prosperity prosperity on the local level and on the personal level that is unparalleled on earth. And I think it is these special people in the capitalist system that have developed all these wonderful, wonderful things and advances that have come down and ultimately been achieved by the everyday working class person in America. And that to me is the miracle, the really the beauty of capitalism is the benefits do come down to everyone in the system in due course. Not everything happens at first. That's very true. But monopoly is one of the things I think we really have to make sure we don't have. The healthcare system in the U.S. today is monopolistically run. We don't know what the prices are. We don't know what the what the outcomes are or any of that. And you still have to go to hospitals without any of that knowledge. We need to put transparency in there and bring it back to a capitalist system, not the way it's run right now, which is opaque, no price system. So that's my view. I think these people are the benefic beneficiaries of the world, not the enemies and that capitalism allows us to have those people that would never have existed without a free enterprise, pro-growth, democratic, economic capitalism, my view. Professor Wolf, what is a Marxist solution to, what, what is this, what is the um, uh, approach to dealing with an economic surplus? What do you do with the surplus once it's there? All right, well, let, let me respond. I'll try to get to that question, but let me respond just to, the, to, to Art Laffer's uh, last comments. Uh, and, and no disrespect to him whatsoever. I, I'm enjoying this conversation. I admire him anyway. Um, when systems are in decline is when you hear most often the lament that goes like this. Yeah, our problem is in our, our system is in trouble. Yeah, our system has a lot of warts all over it. But it is in the end human nature. It, you can't break out of this. It's given by our physical existence. In the declining days of slavery, it was all, always heard, look, the human community divides into those who are masters and those who are slaves. If God didn't want you to be a slave, he wouldn't have made you that way. But if you're trying to undo slavery, then you, little puny human being, are undoing God's work. It's the desperate effort to hold on to a system versus to ask, and to really ask in an honest way, can't we do better? Isn't it possible to arrange the society to do better than it is now doing? 
And the end of slavery was a clash between those who believed it was written in the DNA of our species versus those who said, we can do better. For a long time, the ones who thought it was in our species prevailed. But as we now know, the enemies of slavery who said you can do better did in the end prevail. We don't have massive slavery anymore. The same thing happened in what used to be called the Ancien Régime, the end of feudalism in, Midi in Europe. We're just doing the capitalist phase now. We have the people who think it's built in, it's the best we can do, there can't be better, this is wonderful, let's celebrate it, versus those who say, yeah, it has achievements, slavery did too, and yeah, it has terrible faults, we can do better. Socialists, if they have anything in common with one another, is we can do better. And I believe that if you transform industry from the top-down hierarchy we think is somehow necessary, and by the way, public enterprises and private enterprises have that in common. They use how do we incentivize? Yeah. How, how do we incentivize a business to not be hierarchical? Because uh, Dr. Wolf, you, you mentioned this several well, times. Yeah, the, if, well, if, the answer is simple. The yeah. answer is simple. Just ask people. Ask the mass of people in every enterprise, do you want to be told what to do from the minute you enter this enterprise to the minute you exit? Do you want to be told what to do, where to sit, what machine to use, how to function with it? And at the end of the day, having poured your mind and body into producing something, you go home and somebody else decides what's going to be done with the fruits of your labor, or would you rather have a democratic system where you have some say in all of that. Look, we know where people went three centuries ago. Capitalism came in by overthrowing the feudalism before. The mass of workers are now in the process of figuring out that capitalism has to go. That's why the conversation about socialism is everywhere. I just read that the Hoover Institute in Stanford, where Art Laffer and I did our education years ago, has just released a new program of the whole Hoover Institute on the fact that socialism is once again on the agenda. I'm reminded of Mark Twain's famous argument when he read in the Hartford newspaper uh, an obituary for himself. <laughs> he wrote the lines, G, to the editor, he wrote a letter. He said, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. The reports of the death of socialism, desperately wanted by those who fear it, are likewise e exaggerated. Because I can tell you, as one, I've never felt more support and more interest in what I'm doing than today. And I've had a long life. I'll let Dr. Laffer respond. And I do have a follow up. Sure, Jim, very quickly, it was capitalism that got rid of slavery in the United States. Slavery has existed forever. It was capitalism, it was the use of that, and the productivity of a capitalist system is much better than productivity of a slavery system. I mean, and you see that happening. It was capitalism that destroyed Wait, the third Just, just to clarify, you mean it's a, it was more of an economic issue than a social issue to end slavery? E economic and social, it was both. It was both together, but they, they clearly the economic issue was very strong as well. Capitalism did not do well under slavery. It did much better under free. When you look at companies today, those employees that don't like being told what to do. I totally agree with, uh, with, with, with Richard on that. I mean, I just totally agree with him. But then again, those companies don't sell well in the stock market. They're not invested in. And participation by employees and creativity by employees and making the companies better are much more successful than those companies that aren't. And a market market system allows us to select those more successful companies and have them predominate. And that's exactly what's happening. You're looking at auto companies, you're looking at all of these companies where markets, free markets, democratic economic capitalism is selecting those where the employees are better treated than they are where they are worsely treated. And, you know, to say that the capitalist system doesn't have, socialism does not have any way, David. 
that doesn't have any way of discriminating between successful companies and unsuccessful companies. And therefore, unsuccessful companies like the post office and like the like the military in the U.S., there are, there are socialist systems. Those systems prevail because there is no market selection for good uh, good production there in the free market system. So free markets will select better companies, better things. And my view is that that's the way to go rather than the post office route or the route of the Defense Department, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. I, I think capitalism is not the Defense Department. It's not the post office. It's really Elon Musk. It's Bill Gates. It's all these other. That's capitalism. My, my question for Dr. Wolf is in a capitalist society, Again, how do we create a non-hierarchical uh, company, right. given that when you think about who puts up the most risk, it's a founder or a group of founders or a group of key individuals who put up the capital, their own resources to start their company. So somebody who might argue against you might say, well, Dr. Wolf, why can we expect a, hierarch a non-hierarchical system when we've got a few key individuals putting up more risk than everybody else in the organization? The answer, to that, the answer to that is very, very simple on two levels. Number one, systems don't disappear because you suddenly have people realizing that there is a better one. Systems disappear when the people living in them can't tolerate and will not tolerate continuing in the condition that they find themselves. The slaves ended up saying it's intolerable. The serfs said it's intolerable. Were they sure where the next system would take them? Of course not. Nobody can predict the future. You have a few general ideas, you go in that direction, and then you muddle your way through. We are discovering now around the world, including in the United States, that capitalism is be becoming less and less acceptable and tolerable. Look at a dozen different polls. The younger the person in the United States, the more criticism of capitalism and the more the interest in socialism. Okay, number one. Number two, risk taking. I've always loved this argument. Capitalists are usually rich people who risk a portion of their wealth. Having a good bit of wealth, they're usually smart enough not to risk all of it. By comparison, what have we got with the worker? The worker is going and taking a job at the Jones Company. You know what that means? He's taking a risk. He doesn't know what the Jones Company's leaders are going to do. He has no knowledge. He has no control. He hopes that when he arrives at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, there's a job for him to do. If they make bad investments, if they make bad decisions, his job is lost. His wife, his children, or her husband, her children, are then victimized by decisions they were excluded from. That's a fantastic risk. What are you talking? This notion that the risk is only by the investor. The joke is they take less of a life changing risk than the workers do. And if you want really to run this argument, if you want to justify the enormous wealth of those who risk their capital, then let there be a payment for the risk taken by the workers. Supplement their wages because that's a payment for labor, with another payment for the risk they and their dependents are taking. This argument was make-believe. It was invented by people who knew they had a problem. Everybody yeah. helps produce profit, but only a tiny minority in every company get it. That's a problem. That's unfair. That's unjust. That's unequal. you got to come up with some BS to justify it, risk I, risk was one of those BSs. Yeah, two two things. Workers have a lot of choice in the matter, especially in modern day society, whether to get educated, whether to become skilled in industrial tech, and what jobs they take, what professions they go into. Workers are not without choice today. Uh, far from it. They have a lot of choice today. Capitalists are also not without choice. And it's not that workers can't make bad decisions. They do. And it does risk their wives and their children and all that stuff, or their husbands and their children, depending on whether it's a female worker or a male worker. That's all true. And the same thing with capitalists. It's this system of profit and loss that has generated the prosperity over time. 
If we didn't have any, if the earth were to end six months from now or six years from now, I think an equal distribution of wealth would make sense. But what we need to do, David, is to make sure that we create a political economy of growth, as my professor Paul Buran used to argue, a political economy of growth, which created better living standards, better lives in the future than they were in the past. And it's only through trial and error, risk and return, and it, on both the labor portion and also on the capital portion, uh, you know, Richard is completely correct. It is capitalist risk taking. They have extra, but workers do too. Uh, workers have a choice and they have a skill set. And it's that dynamic that creates the prosperity that is known as human progress. And that's the thing I love about a capitalist system is it's not all done by one but Chairman Xi sitting there in one thing, dictating the whole damn mess and creating a feudal system that never made products progress in the world. Well, one, one, one final subject I, I like to cover, and uh, we can spend a few minutes on this, is, again, going back to addressing the income inequality problem. Um, it occurs to me that several politicians even today have advocated for taxing the rich and giving it to the poor. It's uh, yes. it's not a new Thank policy. You. It's uh, it's something that's been established. But let me just read to you Biden's proposal, which he came out with earlier in the year, several months ago. It's it's not news, but I'll just read it again. Now he advocated that he we have to reward work, not just wealth. He announced. He said that specifically we have to tax. Uh, of the ultra wealthy, a billionaire tax, if you want to call it, people with a net worth of over a hundred million dollars, twenty five percent. And that's estimated to just, to just apply to 0.01% of all Americans, he argued. So wouldn't be an impact on everyone, just the 0.01%. My question is first to Dr. Wolf and then to Dr. Laffer. Uh, Professor Wolf, do you agree with this policy? And second, what should the government do once they tax the, 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 the billionaires a 25% tax on their wealth? Well, here's my take on this issue. As long as you allow enterprises to be owned and operated by a tiny group of people, the major shareholders and the board of directors, those shareholders elect, you cannot be surprised or upset that those people give themselves the bulk of the surplus being produced. They give it to themselves as dividends as shareholders, and they give it to themselves as multi-million dollar pay packages for top executives. They've been doing that more and more across the history of capitalism. In other words, income and wealth inequality is built in to a system that allows a small group of people to dominate each and every enterprise, which is why, as a socialist, I'm in favor of democratizing uh, the enterprise. Therefore, I don't have much faith in President Biden. Whether he gets this tax increase or not isn't going to change the basic system. It's window dressing. It's going to make him maybe look good to people who care about this. And maybe that's a traditional Democratic politician's game. But that beyond that, it doesn't address the problem. Even if you did a tax, the corporate leaders of America have long ago learned how to use stock options and stock payments and deferred payment. As, as Dr. Laffer said, they have an army of accountants and lawyers. That's their job. First of all, they go as lobbyists to shape the law, and then they work as a, a private uh, army to get around whatever the law is that they help to shape. This is a game. As, as uh, Senator Sanders said, it's rigged, and people know that it's rigged. The, tweaking it here, tweaking it there, this percent over here, that doesn't change a system that has produced this kind of inequality over and over again. We are in a period of decline. I know that's hard for Americans like me to get their heads around. We are not what we were. We have real competition in the world the way we haven't in a century. And when systems decline, those at the top, the corporate leaders, the shareholders, 
They have the means and the position to shift the burden of a social decline onto the middle and the bottom below them. That's what we're watching. That's why your car is smaller, your square foot in your apartment is smaller. That's why you're shifting from hamburger to hamburger helper. It, it is a shifting as we decline. We saw it in Britain. We're seeing it here now. One thing to observe it, much harder to live it. Dr. Laffer, what's wrong? I'll let you respond, but just- I need to respond to that if I- yeah, not to yeah, Okay, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I, I, want to respond to, I want to respond to your question, not, not to his comment. I do agree with uh, Richard's comments on little, most of that. Tax sheltering is a huge deal. The rich are able to get- a, That's all, all true. But I have just finished the book, Taxes Have Consequences, which is the entire history of the U.S. income tax. We have every single tax return. We know how the, all the top tax rates, it's all this Piketty, Saez, Sancheva, uh, Zuckman type of stuff there that, that uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden are, are spouting. Every single time we've raised the highest marginal income tax rate, every single time the economy has underperformed. Every single time we've lowered the highest marginal income tax rate in the top 1%, the economy has outperformed. Clearly, that's number one. Number two, every time we've raised the highest tax rate on the highest uh, income earners in the U.S., the poor have suffered the most dramatically. Income inequality would improve, but that's because the rich incomes, reported incomes, fell much more than the incomes. But let me just tell you, when they raised the highest tax rates in the 1930s, the poor, the minorities, the disenfranchised did not do well, even though income inequality reduced dramatically. It's because the rich incomes fell because they sheltered their income. They didn't report it anymore. They did do badly, but the poor got hammered. During World War II, the poor were hammered beyond belief, even though income inequality was much less. Afterwards, when income inequality improved, when you dropped the highest tax rates on the rich, poor did much, much better. The minorities, the disenfranchised did much better. Income inequality can occur two ways. One, that the rich get richer faster than the poor get richer or the rich get poorer faster than the poor get poorer, that both of those lead to more income inequality, more income equality. But what you really have is during periods of tax cuts on the rich, the poor get richer much, much faster, even though income inequality as measured goes down because the poor report, because the rich report their income. And by the way, when you raise taxes on the rich, tax revenues from the top 1% of income earners collapse before your very eyes. When you lower tax rates on the rich, as happened throughout the whole income period, tax revenues from the top 1% of income earners goes way up. Just look at the facts. This is not, David, I've got to say, this is not a matter of opinion. You're not allowed your opinion here. This is a matter of facts, not how you feel. And when we raise tax rates on the rich, the economy is underperformed. When we lower them, the economy is outperformed. And this is a new phenomenon starting in 1913 that had not existed before. And Joe Biden is a victim of stupid economics and stupid policies, as is Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, AOC, and all these others. High tax on the rich do not help the economy. Just one follow-up, and I'll let Dr. Wolf respond. Dr. Dr. Laffer, so your research, and notwithstanding your research and the facts and the statistics you brought up, what is the... Let's just argue with the principle here. What is wrong, or if the, if there anything is wrong with the principle of taking a small percentage of relatively small percentage of the ultra wealthy's wealth and just redistributing that into the bottom fifty percent with maybe UBI That's or right. better social security or Nothing whatnot? Nothing wrong with that idea. Nothing is wrong with that idea if it worked. But it, unfortunately, it doesn't work. You know, when you take from those who have a little bit more, they produce a little bit less. When you give to those who have a little bit less. You provide them with an alternative source of income and they too produce a little bit less. You know, this is the transfer theorem. It's math. It's not left wing, right wing, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat. What happens when you do take from the rich a little bit and you give it to the bottom part? That's a question of empiricism. That's what I tried to do with this damn book is look, we have every single tax return, David. It's not as though you have data. I can easily imagine your results being correct. I can easily imagine, but they aren't. That's not the way the facts go. When you raise taxes on the rich, the rich do less well. That's true. But they also shelter the hell out of their income and the poor get hammered. 
That's what happened every damn time. Look at the tax rate increase in 1932 when we went from a 24% income tax rate to a 63% on up to a 94%. Though so the poor, the minority disenfranchised were killed in the Great Depression. And World War II, it was disastrous for lowest income workers. And then look at what happened under Kennedy when he cut tax rates dramatically on the rich from 91% to 70%. The poor, the minority disenfranchised improved their lot in life dramatically. Look at what happened under Reagan. All I can tell you is we have facts in front of us. This is not about opinions. It's not about what could or not could happen. I agree with all of you guys on your hypothetical examples. What are the facts? The facts are really simple. When we raise tax rates to the rich to give to the poor, the poor got hammered and the rich sheltered their income and excluded. That's Professor Wolf, let's respond to this data. Uh, I mean, it's, it's I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy with, with what Dr. Laffer said. For me, it demonstrates that if you're in a capitalist system, if you lower the tax rates, rich people will take the steps we know they will take, and you will, in the end, see a capitalist system do what capitalist systems always do. The rich keep being richer, and the rest of us don't. And if the poor get a better shake for a while, just wait another few years, and all of that will be undone. But, but isn't, it, isn't it true, Dr. Wolf, that if the rich get richer, everybody else gets marginally richer as well, even if the wealth gap widens? Is that true, based on your observation? No, no, that's not true. Let me give you a simple example. Oh, that is true. That's From, the facts. No, no here's the, the facts. Here's the facts. From 1970s, middle 1970s, to pretty much now, the real wage in the United States has gone nowhere. It's a stagnant line, goes like this. If you average it out, it's between a quarter and half a percent per year, which is a statistical nothing. Meanwhile, the productivity, I mean, that's wrong. The, the productivity of the worker has gone straight up in a line of one to two percent across that time. That, that's not true. But, but productivity is what the worker gives the employer. Wage but, is but what your, the your employer... facts are incorrect, Richard. Your facts are incorrect. Please, you know, under Kennedy, where we had the big tax cuts, there wages, median wages went way up for workers during that period. Now, when we had Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, they didn't. You're very right there, but you can't clop all these things together as one thing. The productivity growth under Reagan was much higher than it was under Carter or under uh, Lyndon Johnson or under these others. You got to look at what actually happened, sir. You can't just collapse them all. In the big things and say no way productive productivity growth under kennedy and under reagan was much much higher than the other right, ones I, and it I'm was looking. much higher under donald trump as well you've right. got to look at what happens not what you like to happen and what you i can agree, talk I about, agree. You, you've got but to I'm, not blow me you got to go hit me with the numbers let's get the yearly just, data on I, productivity and i'll just show I, you the facts and hope you concede the position that you're wrong no, you're just i've looked at i've looked at the I've looked at no, the you, you haven't looked at them. I've got every single tax return. No one has looked at them. I looked at Saez, Piketty, Sancheva, all of these guys, and they don't look at the data that they only have. What I'm telling you is factual. Year in, year out, it happens quickly. And then it goes right back when you get a socialist coming in. Right. Oh, well, I, it's hard to explain to we've you, had no, I would we've, love to have you. Give me a had review. No, Give me a review had no, book, we, and I'll go through it with you. Okay. We've had no socialist in this country since the 1970s. If oh, you, Joe Biden is much more you, of a socialist than John than, than Trump. And, and Jimmy and Obama and W were clearly socialists. Clinton was a capitalist, clearly cut tax rates and get economic growth. Well, it, it, Reagan it, was again. George but, W. Bo Herbert Walker Bush was a socialist. I mean, we've had very major revisions in tax rates and policies. And every single time the model I'm describing to you holds true. It's every time, not just you can't. Right, you have it, but on, 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 on. every you single can't. one of the every single one of the men you name, Obama, Clinton, Bush, loved capitalism, said so over and over again. If you want to call them socialists, of course, no one can stop you. No, they're but high taxers. They're high have spenders. a problem. They're big, if, they're big left. At the very least, at the very least. 
at the very least, you have to recognize that yours might be the idiosyncratic definition of socialism, not the people who you call socialists who would insist that you are completely wrong, that they are lovers of capitalism. The biggest achievement of Mr. Trump, you must know, was the tax cut of the December that was my baby. 2017. Absolutely. Yeah, that, and it worked beautifully. Yeah, well, I mean, revenues went up. And I know, the but the people, the, poor, the, the people, the disenfranchised were the lowest ever. The people and we had growth who, that exceeded everything before. I mean, it was amazing how it worked. And it, it, it had to, net revenues came in. Oh, well, yeah. you know, he, I, it's hard to do it when you don't want to do on the facts. Give me I your do, numbers, I do. Please, I'm dealing with the facts. Are, the facts are that the productivity of labor went up faster over the last 50 years than did the wages. And that's why we have But, but it's not even. But it's not even. Minute. You can't that's take 50 why... years. That under Trump, productivity of workers went up and median wages went up like never before. $6,000 increase in real wages in that period. And you blur that into everyone else. You can't do that. You've got to look at the variations within that series and see that under Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, the bad periods outweighed the good periods, but the good periods were there. We need to emulate the good periods and not the bad ones. And all I'm saying is I'm not trying to be a socialist in your sense of the word. I am a huge admirer of Paul Baranz, as you and I are. We are both students of his, and we both understand it. But you've got to be a statistician here, Richard. You can't just go waving your arms and talking about 70-year trends. You've got to look at what happened inside those. When did the median income go up? Under John F. Kennedy, median wages went way up. Under Ronald Reagan, they went way up. Under Donald Trump, they went way up. They went way down under Biden. They went down under Obama, Obama, and W. Those two guys were terrible. And right, you know, they got you, the but all right. and all that. All right, I don't want to debate with you the statistics, but you know, I do. Well, that I do you know, you, you know as well as I do that what happens during the four years of a person who's a president was shaped by the things that happened two, four, six, eight, and ten years before. Baloney, I do giving, not believe that. I don't giving know the that. credit, giving the credit to the guy who sits at the top, who's largely a figurehead, is a bizarre way. I of don't think that's it. true. I worked with them personally. All of these people. I I was very involved in the tax cuts and jobs act. I was the guy who, in part, designed all of the Reagan income tax rate reductions and that stuff, the free trade model, NAFTA, and all of that. I was the first American to go to China in 1970 when China started freeing its markets. I watched it from the top in and watch what they did. And I watched the results and I've written about it in detail in data terms, not just waving my arms, but these are, we're talking about facts and only facts. That's I what agree. you've got to base your arguments on, not on, uh, uh, not on rhetoric. You, you've got to be, and you and I do agree that the models that Baran did make all the sense of the world. And I'm not arguing against those models and I'm not arguing against what you say, but I am arguing against how you describe this sort of blend of from 1970 to the present, the capitalist system is all the same. It's not. And no, I don't corrections think, I, in the capitalist system are much better to achieve prosperity than trying to devise a new worker class upward building thing that I don't think will work. I know. I know that. And you, I hope it did. If it did, I'd be your biggest advocate ever. Believe me. But it doesn't work. Look at the numbers. You've, you've got to be a scientist on this and look at data. And you can't just say opinions, well, I, opinions, opinions, opinions. If we had data. if we had time, I would show you the research done that write a write a review of my book. Enterprise. Write a review of let, my let book, me. please. And do it and if you would, I would love it if you would. And and you know, and rebut all of my statistical arguments in there. Do that. I'd yes. love to see that. Or my book on states. You know, why are some states outperforming others? It's because their tax cuts, their pro-growth policies, their, their right to work positions. You know, these are things that really do matter. We have better wage growth here in Tennessee than in any other state. We have the biggest reduction in the gap between African-American students and other students. We have the biggest growth in ed education achievement. All of that because we have the lowest taxes. We have right to work. We have, you know. It, these are data arguments. My 2014 book, The Wealth of States, The History of the U.S. Income Tax. I would love to have that. And David, would you please monitor when, when we can talk about facts as well as just opinions and just sort of uh, you know, theorize. Let me, let, let I'm, me I'm happy to do a let me follow close, up. Yeah. With, let me Thank close you, it David. with a simple reference to facts. I'm not, I'm not 
a, a supporter, particularly of the People's Republic of China. I'm critical of many things that go on there, as I am of critical of things that go on here in the United States. But let's look at the facts of China. They have an extremely powerful Communist Party sitting at the top and regulating what they do. They have a huge public employment sector of state-owned and operated enterprises, and they really closely regulate many aspects of private capitalism in their society. And they have grown their output because of their tax cuts, not because me, of the let government. Me, let me just let me just monetary policy because of their trade policies. They not have because of waving arms. They, they have outgrown the United States for a generation Absolutely. by two to three years, times, two to three times the the wealth. Sixty six fold each increase in real output they for the used, adults they versus have used, four percent fourfold. They have used their their economic growth the most spectacular economic Amazing. growth in the shortest Wonderful. time that we know of in modern history, outdoing yes. even the Soviet Union in the 19th, in the 20th century, and way faster than Western capitalism ever. Totally did. true. Totally true. And so because of what, economics. We see, what we see is a society with a powerful communist party, with a large and influential government enterprise system doing real well but that's Not got true. nothing to do with what we're talking about it's what they, they it's what the government did in policies that mattered when they no, cut taxes no, as, I they, said, what, as i said as i said the government in, in did 1970 93% right, of the state run enterprises now it's below 10% that's a tax cut they yes, pegged right. the yuan to the us dollar they increased free trade that's why they grew and now they're reversing that and you watch my you watch what happens in china it's going to be a shit show in China. They're now in a death spiral because now they can't keep their goddamn hands out of the economy again. Uh, okay, okay. Well, one at a time. All right. So, 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 Sorry. Dr. That, Dr. Wolf. I, let, let. The prediction that the Chinese economy was in a death spiral, that the it Chinese is. economy was, was. issuing statistics that were false, that the Chinese economy was unbalanced 12 different ways. Those have been aired and re-aired every year for the last 30 years. Meanwhile, China grew to become the powerhouse of that it now cuts. is. You can credit whatever you want. I'm, I do my want point, that. That's my, point, my point is they organize their enterprises with employer, employee. Tell that Jack Ma that. They chose not to depart from Tell the Jack Ma capitalist that system. Tell Jack Ma that cog, cog in the wheel of socialism. Capitalism is defined by the employer-employee relationship. Just in like feudalism. Let, let, let Professor Wolf finish, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to Dr. Laffer, please. No. Feudalism uh, is defined by lord and serf, slavery by master and slave. The slaves thought they could do better, and we got rid of slavery. The serfs thought they could do better, we got rid of feudalism. The employees are in the process of figuring out we can do better than capitalism, and that's the way forward. And the reason that will be important is not because the image is so entrancing, although I find it to be. It will be because of the capitalism art is trying to hold on to has long ago disappeared in favor of a government plus big business hold on the economy that produces all of the things Art and I agree are disasters for modern capitalism. We differ. He imagines that the government can be pushed back out. And I don't think big, big business do, has yeah, any yeah. dream of doing it. And I argue that the masses at the bottom who suffer They'll be the ones, as always, to make the change because this is a system that is no longer tolerable. Uh, David, okay, he's doc, right. Dr. Laffer, he's, yes. He's, he's just right. Uh, I do believe that the capitalist system can be resurrected. Uh, we can have a low rate, broad based, flat tax. We can have uh, uh, spending restraint. We can have sound money. We can have free trade. We can have minimal regulations. And I do believe the capitalist system can be corrected and made much better. And uh, we both see the world in the same light. By the way, I, I really do with Richard and I appreciate 
But I really do want you to look at the details because a lot of it, as, as a guy, friend of ours uh, once said, Einstein said, uh, 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 the, the system lurks in the finite uh, in the details. Everything is in the details. And the details here are communist governments can put in good economic policies. Capitalist governments can put in good economic policies. Socialist governments cannot. Uh, they <laughs> believe in redistribution. And I think if we use our old definition of socialism, you and I, Richard, I think that's the way we talk about it. Uh, whether it's state-run governments or whether it's dem democracy, tax cuts work. And Jack Ma is a perfect example of a lowly cap of worker. I'm just joking. Uh, the wealth and the billionaires, as you said, that are coming out of China are coming out of a communist China where income redistribution and income inequality is huge in China. It's huge. And that's because of the state-run enterprises freeing it and allowing progress to occur. And I love your arguments, by the way, and thank you for letting me, because you got me all excited, because I think we both have the same vision of a, of a world, uh, and we just have two different ways of getting to it. I want to really bring in the capitalist system with constraints, and, and you want to bring in a worker's view of the world, which I understand and have been taught very heavily. And um, thank you for the well, debate. Have you have you two different. ever met? You both went to Stanford. What we'll, 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 we'll did here? Have you? Yeah, as soon as I like came in the Econ Department, he left. He left. And as soon as I left Yale, he went there. So he has been avoiding me for something like 83 years. He's 81. I'm 83. So he's been avoiding me for 81 years. And now that I know where he lives and I have his contact info, he is about to be a, a <laughs> with visitations and discussions with Professor Laffer. Well, Sorry, uh, about I, it, Richard. Let, let, let me first of all conclude by thanking you, David, for arranging this Thank and you. for taking the initiative to have this kind of conversation. Um, I don't know how much light versus heat we generated, but we made our effort. Um, and you're you're the person who gets the credit for making this no. event happen. Yes, that's true. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a fly in the wall of two great uh, d d no, thinkers having no, no, a great no. discussion. So I, I appreciate just being here as 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 does our audience. So I thank you both for and doing I, this. Where I, can I wanted, we? I wanted to end yes. by making a deal with Art. I will read and review his book if he takes a look at one of mine called Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism, because that I makes, love the, argument, I that makes the argument in detail that we had to kind of be summary about in the time limits of David's program. I will do it very, and you would do the other, and I would love that. I, All right. you know, I, I have a feeling I'm going to like your book a lot, and uh, I think we think very much along the same lines. It's just how we get to where the nirvana that we both want to get to. And I just, just for the audience, did. just for the audience, where can we learn more about your current work? Now, uh, Professor Wolf, I'll start with you. You mentioned you have uh, yeah, there are, a book there are, and there are, your program. You have a TV program as well? Yes. Uh, there are two websites and a TV program. The websites are the following. Democracy at work, all one word, dot info. So the first website, democracy at work, dot info. The second website, rdwolfme.com, and that's wolf spelled W-O-L-F-F. -F. And finally, I do a weekly radio and television program called Economic Update, which you can find. Uh, it's aired about 100 radio stations across the country, goes out to 50 million people on free speech TV and other networks. And finally, you can find us, Democracy at Work, or uh, and me uh, on YouTube, where all of our work is posted. So it's easy to find what we do and to see these kinds of arguments developed. Dr. Laffer, where can we read more of your thoughts? You know, the one, the central one there is LafferCenter.org uh, would be there. Uh, I'm also on TV all the time, if, if all across the station, MSNBC, CBS, and you know CNN, Fox, all of them across the board. There, you can look up any of those there. Uh, but the one you may want to look at is uh, is uh, Hillsdale, the course uh, on macroeconomics. Uh, my lectures there, which I would go through all of the macroeconomics and cover a lot of the topics that we've discussed here. And you can get my books. You can get my books. You can look them up on Amazon and all that.
All right. We'll put the links in the description down below. So make sure to follow both Professor Richard Wolf and Dr. Art Laffer in the description, uh, links in the description down below. Thank you very much, gentlemen, both of you. I, I don't want to hold, hold up too much more of your time. So we'll end it here. Appreciate it. We'll do this again. It was fun. Thank you. David, it was great fun. Richard, it, thanks fun. Very much fun. Same here. Same here. Appreciate talk to you, it. Talk to you both later. appreciate the tone okay. as well as the content. And the respect I have for you is, is enormous. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Have a great day, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.